Good to be here. Always good to be here. So, um, welcome to my second Matt R chat of 2020. I'm following up the first R chat that I did with Matt Jordan with another author whose name is uh, Mirna El Mahdi from Cairo in Egypt. Now, I met Mirna two years ago at the Cairo International Film Festival and we became friends and shortly after that I saw that she published her first novel which when I was there last year I actually forgot to ask her about because I was just so busy running around doing interviews with the filmmakers and guests that were at the festival for Fred Film Radio, the radio that I've collaborated with for years. Uh, and so with the new year I decided that I simply had to find out more about what she'd written. And when we started messaging back and forth I realized as well that she was not only working on her second novel but that her second novel was due to be published in the new year which is now. And so we talk a little bit about that too in a very cool conversation that involves a lot of chatter about um, tradition and death and just writing techniques, style, a little bit of cinema in there too, all sorts of stuff. So I hope you'll enjoy sitting around the lava lamp, listening to us talk, eavesdropping on our conversation and realizing that, um, especially if you're in the creative arts, you're not alone and if you're a writer you may not be the only one who does most of her or his writing in bed. Enjoy. Hello. Hello, Mirna. It's good to hear your voice. It's nice to hear your voice too, Matt. How are you doing? Uh, this I'm doing. I'm doing pretty well. I, I you know, I've just uh, come back from the gym, so I'm a bit. Um, my 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 muscles are a bit sore. I feel like a. I feel like uh -huh. an old man, which I am becoming an old man, but hopefully not <laughs> a grumpy old man. <laughs> you cannot go to the gym and feel old. <laughs> Oh, I feel terrible. And everyone else looks great. And I'm just like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we so, belong to fast food things, yeah. Yeah. Hey, so uh, this is the wonder of the internet. Uh, now we are able to call people who are half the world away. You are very far from me right now. I'm in Perugia in Italy and you are in Cairo, I believe, right? Yep. Isn't that isn't it great to be in the internet age where we can just talk to each other no matter where in the world we are? Well, I feel that really tech is fascinating. I mean, you get to connect with all the people from all over the world and you can actually reach to whatever you want to learn or read about just by the click of a button. I remember, I mean, back in the old days, people would go to libraries and go through hundreds of books and spend a lot of time away from home to just learn something new. But now you can do it in bed with on your phone and that's it. Yeah, I, I feel like it's also a little bit scary because maybe we are becoming lazier in finding out information. That's just an opinion that I kind of have. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, definitely. Because... Definitely, um, I mean... Now yeah, the information is out there. On the phones. Yeah, not on the playground, not exploring, not feeling and communicating with nature. They just mm. use their phones to play and that's it. And it's kind of sad. Yeah. So we met at the Cairo International Film Festival two years ago. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what did yes. you do? Yeah, I mean, how did you get involved with the Cairo International Film Festival? Well, um, I used to work for the presidential conferences, and uh, I met a friend there. Uh, he was working for a Cairo Film Festival as well, so he told me that I can join them this year because I speak French and English, so they wanted me to join the International Press Bureau with uh, Brigitte Portier. 
Yes. And I was lucky enough to go there and meet all those cool people that are now living on the other side of the world. And thanks to technology, I got to talk to them the way I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. And do you like movies? I'm in love with films. You are? I mean, who, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't like films? I mean, you get to travel and, and meet characters just on your seat. Well, it, it kind of shows how la- lazy you are to explore things just through a screen. But isn't it just fascinating for someone to get you involved through their cinematic art? I mean, you just go and watch something and you feel it with every cell within your body and and you interact with all the characters, all the events. And once the movie ends, you still have this impact of how you changed your perspective through something you've watched. Just 90 minutes can do this to you. Uh, do you do you remember what the first film you watched was? Not your not your favorite film, but what was your f- the first film that you remember watching? The first film I remember watching, I think it was Terminators. I think. No, really. I think this was. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Wow, that's I mean, a scary uh, movie for a kid. It is. It, it, it was terrifying, but my mom, she kept saying all the time that this is just a movie. This is not real, but it was very real to me. And I don't know why this is the first thing that I remember watching. It was like the very old Terminator ones, the, the one in the 80s, yeah. not the new version or something. Where, where Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a bad guy. Yep. <laughs> to me, it Can was a remember? shock. Yeah, I think I was five or something back then. Well, you know, the thing about that film, and it's funny that we're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I remember when I was a kid, he was a good guy in every movie, and I loved Arnold Schwarzenegger because he was just my, one of my favorite heroes. Yeah. And I saw this film, and I was still a child, and he was a bad guy. I was so confused. I was like, I'm, yeah. I, I'm not supposed to be like rooting for Arnold Schwarzenegger in this film? This is weird. <laughs> Actually, I thought back then that he was the good guy. Hmm. You made me think. I believed in him that much. <laughs> you made me think, actually, that maybe me watching that film and being confused about who I should side with was actually a very mm-hmm. important moment in my life. And uh, maybe it shaped the way in which I interact with people. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's true. And for some reason, after watching this film, I've always been on the villain side. <laughs> I mean, I've always voted for the Joker, not Batman. So, interesting. Yeah. Why is that? Why? Why is, is there another reason besides this Arnold Schwarzenegger view and experience when you were a kid? Um, no, because when it comes to writing, I believe that villains are more interesting. It's really easy to write about a very peaceful, someone who's fighting for good, someone who's helping others, it's it's, it's a piece of cake. But to build a villain with a goal that you can relate to and to have flaws and pros and cons for his character, it was way more interesting for me than just watching someone who's doing good for the sake of doing it. Right, right. And in fact, that's, that's that's what I was so fascinated with. Um, when I found out that, um, sh- I think shortly after I met you, uh, two years mm-hmm. ago, you published, yeah. was it your first novel? Yes, it's the first one to be published. Oh, right. So have you been writing all your life? Since I was eight. <laughs> oh, okay. So let's start with that, actually. I'm, I'm curious yeah. to find out. What is it that made you want to start writing? Well, two things. Um, my entire family, they are really good with drawing, and I really sucked at that. I used to try to do and do things, but they were very confusing, and no one understood what I was painting. So once I was, I think I was seven back then, I just told one of my aunties that, look at this drawing, and she couldn't get it. So she told me, what is that about? So I started telling her the story of a kid who went to the shore without asking for his mom's permission. So the shark ate him. It was something really (laughs) psycho back then. So my auntie, she told me, you have, no, this is not how we draw a shark. We draw it this way. So mom, she just interfered and said, Maybe she's not good at drawing, but she's a good storyteller. 
and she started telling me, why don't you tell me more stories and we can start writing them together and do you your little bedtime stories book. Hmm. So I used to tell her things and she used to write them on my behalf because I couldn't write very good back then. I, I was too young at the time. And later on, I developed my writing skills and I started writing my own things. But the turning point is when when I was eight, my mom, she's like a very caring person that whenever you call her, she's around and she always takes care of you and everything. But um, once I was calling for her and she couldn't hear me, so I came closer and I started talking to her, but she didn't respond. She was holding a book and she was sinking into that book. She was like reading it with all of her senses that she didn't even notice my presence at that. So I touched her. This is, was the moment that she realized that I was actually there and talking to her. So I told her, Mom, what are you doing? I've been talking for you like for five minutes. She told me, sorry, I'm reading this very interesting book that I felt that I am inside of its world and I couldn't notice that you were around. So I told her what book was that. She was reading Harry Potter for J.K. Rowling, the first book. Hmm. And she took me into her lab and she started telling the whole story for me. So I felt like, how can something made of paper that has no visual things, that has no drawings, nothing, just few words that can take someone away like this? This is why I feel that it feels like real magic, not just the magic of the Harry Potter world, but the magic of writing a book. So yeah. this was kind of a turning point for me to start actually writing my own books. I think uh, Harry Potter was a very um, influential book for many people of our generation. Is, was, it, was it influential for you as well, the whole series of Harry Potter books? Yeah, I mean, I have all of her T-shirts, all of J.K. Rowling's quotes. I keep reading the book every year. I have to read the entire sequel, and I have to binge watch the, the eight movies. J.K. Rowling, she had, like, very this, this huge impact on me, mm. not just for how good of a writer she is and how good she does all the characterization part in her films and her movies, as, uh, in her books as well, but the part of her journey and how no one believed in her but her mom and how she was rejected by so many publishers. The first book was rejected by 13 publishers and told her that you'll never make it. You're just writing for children. This kind of books will not sell. And now she became a billionaire just from writing. So she really inspires me whenever I feel down or rejected. She inspires me. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, but, but from your story, you just telling me about, uh, let's say, your formative years. It does sound like you came from a family that, if not strictly artistic, did have artistic inclinations. You know, they had an interest for the arts. Um, do you think that was important to have that? Well, kind of. I mean, um, usually kids, they just mimic their parents when they are so young and um, here in Egypt we have a thing that it, it's really rare that you find a family member who's different from their parents or a child taking a different turn it's a little bit different in the eastern culture but my mom she was very open-minded and she would never guide me through just like you have to be a doctor you have to be an engineer she was never like that she always kept our options and she let us try every kind of sport, every kind of art, until we shape our own identity. Oh. So I was lucky to have that. I, I am really lucky to have a very supportive family. And my sister and my mom, they would just sit down and hear all of my crappy writing ever since I was eight, until I developed my skills. And they, they would dedicate their time just to read a 500-page book that I wrote to just give me their feedback. So I was really lucky from yeah. this point. Yeah, I really was. I, I, I cannot say that I just had this suffering and I was rejected. No, I was actually very lucky when it comes to family-wise. But our culture, it, it's not always, I mean, here in the Eastern world, just for being a female, they would expect you to write something romantic, something uh, for teenagers, especially if you're that young. 
Mm. But what I was working on is to, to accept that actually women can write crime, they can write psycho thriller. I mean, Agatha Christie, she's the goddess of crime genre. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, there's so many, even not, even from beyond the literary world, so many women that mm -hmm. uh, wrote dark kind of mystery move, uh, stories and all of that. But what was it like yeah. to, I mean, this this may seem like a, a silly question to ask, but I am curious, what was it like to to grow in uh, grow up in Cairo and you just, you know, wanting having all these artistic aspirations from an early age? It feels like every time you go to a place, it's your visit to go there. I mean, um, I um, I was lucky that I had a period where I worked in downtown. Egypt, Cairo, where you can find all these 200 years old buildings and uh, this 150 years old cafes. Uh, it, it's really artistic and this actually the place where my novel takes place. So every time I go there, you get, you get to see things differently depending on which character are you thinking about. So it's like you have all these characters inside of you and you have different pairs of eyes each time you go to somewhere else and each time you just look to the sky you see it from the perspective of the character you're trying to relate to right now so you can use their voice correctly um, in your novel right. so Cairo what, what was really good about it that you get to meet all kind of people from different kind of financial financial cultural and educational levels mm. Yeah, so that's true. Have, they say, they did yeah. say. I mean, I I I've been there twice now, but I, I definitely yeah. don't know Cairo. <laughs> I, I would never <laughs> think of myself as a Cairo expert. I think that you need a long time to find out more about a city that's as huge as Cairo. But what, from what I've heard, and I did perceive it while I was there, Cairo, even in every way, is a city with many layers, and it's a different city. Sure. Even even just from individual people make up the fabric of a city. I mean, you could be walking down a street and it's just a different street depending on where you're from or what you're doing. It's 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 really just a, a multi-layered city. I, I, that's that's how I felt about it, anyways. That's true. I mean, just one different bus station or subway station. You could be from a very sophisticated compound to the slums. I definitely want to ask you about that, that, that book that you, you wrote, your first published novels. But before I do, yes. I want to find out where you wrote it. I mean, some people like to write um, in bars. Other people just want to get completely isolated from the world while they write. Where do you write? Uh, where did you write this book specifically? I mean, if there's a place where you wrote the most uh, while you were working on this novel. You're going to laugh, but um, I usually go to different places just to brainstorm. Mm. But when it comes to actually sitting down and writing, I usually write in bed. That's, that's what I do. I, I don't write outside of my room. I don't do that. Oh. But uh, I always go around places. So if I'm just going to write um, a specific scene in a specific location, I would just go there and sit for an hour and write everything I heard, everything I saw, everything I smelled, everything I touched. Then I go back home and turn all of this into the scene or the paragraph that I'm willing to write. In your, uh, I, I mean, I do that too, actually. You know, I'm not, I'm not laughing yeah. because I, I, most of the writing I do is in bed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really get, you feel safe. You will not be disturbed or interrupted or anything. So um, this is where you will just be consistent and, and you will keep your face. So tell me, tell me about the story of this book. First of all, what what is its title? It's called the Investigations of uh, Noah Al Alfi. Noah Al Alfi. It's, it's just a name, the name of the character. But um, Noah is what you translate it in English to Noah, the Prophet Noah. Mm. So I I came up with the name because Noah he had a gift and everyone laughed about him and everyone belittled his vision is about 
and this actually what our lead character is going through he have this gift that we have always um, handled in our folkloric uh, legacy and we have it in the Egyptian mythology of talking to the dead yeah. but lately we, we, we're not using, I mean, here in Egypt, we have a huge lack of fantasy element when it comes to writing. Hmm. So, um, I use that. Um, I spend about maybe a year just studying the whole idea of talking to the, to the dead. And I made this huge post on one of the writing groups on Facebook. Have you ever talked to the dead or have you ever sensed a ghost or a spirit? And I got these responses from all over the world, from different religions, from different beliefs, and they all had the same signs in common. They would sense the same thing, they would describe it the same way. Some people do use some sort of prayers to protect themselves or, or otherwise, but they all have been through the same senses mm. of feeling that they had a ghost around or talking to a dead spirit. So this is what our main character goes through, that he has this gift of speaking to the dead, and he works as a policeman because in Egypt we don't have private detectives or something. We, we don't have that. It's illegal. It's illegal? So he's a... Yeah, it's illegal. You, you, you can never go to a crime scene or have a case or something if you're not a policeman. Well, I guess it's for the best. <laughs> Depending yeah. on what, uh, <laughs> but hey, you, you, you yeah. know, I'm so fascinated with the whole, what you just said. I mean, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, really, because on one side of it, I'm frightened of the unknown, so yeah. to speak. And on the other side, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely fascinated. My, my grandmother, uh, from my mother's side, Adele was her name, mm -hmm. and she liked the singer, but said in an Italian accent, you know, Adele. <laughs> And she was yeah, fascinated really with the with the, what people might say paranormal activities, or spirituality, mm -hmm. and she really went to conventions yes. about it because she loved to research and really look into all of this stuff. But have you ever spoken to the dead, Mirna? No, I was not that lucky. I mean, I, I just once had a surgery, and I swear that I have seen my dead grandpa with me like from the beginning of entering to the room, to the operation room, and until I woke up from uh, all these medications and things. I, I could really see him, but I, I have never talked to someone that, or, or maybe sensed their presence or, or something similar. But it, it's, it's very interesting, and actually that our Egyptian mythology is so rich with these tales. And how pharaohs respected the dead and respected their spirit and their transition from this world to another world. So this is why I said, why can't I just use this with a modern character that goes through crimes and he tries to help the dead solving their crimes. And I really like that. But the thing is that um, it's not about superstitions or anything. Yeah. It has a spiritual side. But all the crimes has, have a very logical and scientific solution. Yeah. You know, uh, me growing up in, uh, obviously, in what, what is known as the Western world, the way we mm -hmm. learn about history is we learn about, well, the Stone Age uh, and all of the other ages, early ages. But the first civilization that we really get into quite deep for, the, you know, for children essentially, mm -hmm. is the Egyptian culture. Just on a timeline level, it works out that way. So for me, being in Cairo, it was an absolute... It, 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 was, a, it was a powerful experience because I have been reading about the pharaohs and the pyramids and the sphinx and all of these beautiful things since I was a child. And yet I, I feel like I don't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, I'm privileged to be talking with you at the, right now about the dead, let's say. And I know that there is a, a, that is a huge deal in Egyptian culture. Uh, but yes. if you were to like pick out one, uh, one or a few of the things that, you, that also fascinate you about Egyptian culture and the dead, what, is, what, what would that be? I mean, 
especially speaking with someone who is not familiar with them. How would you explain that? Well, what was uh, what was actually fascinating for me um, that our ancestors they did believe in another world, but not in death. I mean, they know that you will your journey ends in this world, but it will continue on the other side. And this is why they they believed in Anubis. Anubis is um, it's this god that looks like a dog, but it's it's not a dog actually. Uh, it's I think you you must have seen it in a comic book or something. But Anubis would be just your guardian to take you from this journey to the to the other journey, depending on the deeds or the sins that you've done through your life. They will not just that you will die and vanish, and that's the end of the story. You know, they they believe that you will go to a different journey. What was that journey is about? No one knows yet. This is what was really exciting is that how much they believed in both death and life at, at the same time. They did not glorify uh, like uh, death over life or the other way around. Yeah, death as so, part of yeah, the ex so, ex existence. Let's say death as part of existence. Exactly, it is like the beginning of another journey, not the end of it. But are you are you frightened of death? Does does it frighten you? It frightens me to, to lose someone I love, Danny. This is what, what really frightens me. I mean, if I think about a family member dying, it would definitely frighten me. And maybe maybe beca because I I had this experience before where, where I was diagnosed mistakenly with cancer. And I thought that my journey were, will end right now. But uh, the diagnosis was completely wrong, and it was just a tumor and something else, and not cancer at all. But it was a very turning point for me, where you would think, "Am I gonna die right now?" And what I thought is that you would—you don't think about actually yourself dying or not. You think about the people you're leaving behind. Yeah, that's wow. So yeah, when when you heard that, what what was your in very initial reaction when you heard that. I mean, it must be a terrifying thing to go through. Yeah, it, it was especially because I was very young. I was only 20 when I heard it. And um, and I, I was frightened of how my mom would react and how my younger sister would also react. So I didn't feel like uh, I'm going to miss something or I'm going to leave something. All what I thought about is is the people that I'm going to leave behind. Mm. So it depends on well, how you would react towards death. It depends on if you value your life enough or not. Yeah. I, um, yeah if, I, I, if, I, if I was asked, whenever I'm asked, what am I frightened of the most? I mean, I don't say spiders or, any, or clowns or anything like that. I'm very serious mm -hmm. about it when I say that it's the death of the people I love and, uh, and bureaucracy. Because <laughs> that's another thing that scares me. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness! And they are both equally frightening, right? <laughs> oh, but it's funny. But but I mean, death is is something that I I prefer to talk about over uh, <laughs> over bureaucracy any Isn't day. It more interesting. Yeah, yeah it's isn't true. It more interesting? Yeah, because yeah. I don't know what's gonna. We 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 really essentially can believe something is going to happen, but we don't really know and. And it's but, yes. but we know when someone else dies, we know that there's going to be this this physical emptiness that they leave behind, and um, it's yeah, it's tough to. And you know, um, now this is going to sound strange, but sometimes people don't even have to die for them to be to feel as if they're dead to us. I, I mean, I, I know this sounds dark, but it's sometimes. But it's true. Yeah, do, don't you? Don't you feel that way? That sometimes people are just kind of dead to us and it's incredibly sad. Yeah, I mean, the, the more you are, you care about someone yeah. and then things turn around and you just feel very neutral about them. Yeah. Like you're, you, 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 you no longer have positive or negative feelings toward them huh. or you, you no longer hate or love them. This means that they're dead. I mean, you start seeing things in a, in a gray way. So I, I believe so. I mean, um, you, you can actually kill someone from your life without yeah. having them dead. Yeah. Yeah. 
I could make a joke about that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, but I better not. But I have killed people in my life, actually. I have. How it's just um, to protect myself. I had to not literally. <laughs> well, but in a, in a, in wow, a sense. This is a plus I'm gonna write about. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> People are going to know that if anyone is eavesdropping in our conversation, <laughs> I am, I have killed uh, a few people in my life and it's, it's been very painful. Yeah, of course I haven't killed them physically, but it's the same. I mean, I've had to, I've had to kill them. And, it's actually um, harder. It's pretty hard. But so this, this lead character in your novel, Noah, I'm going to call him because I can't quite pronounce <laughs> the name yeah, that you said. It. Yeah. Um, he solves crimes by talking to the dead? Well, n not mainly by talking to the dead because he's actually very smart. So it's not like this is, the, it's not like that's the only way how he solves things around, but um, they can help them by giving clues. I mean, um, some of the, the victims in the novels I, I wrote about because it's actually a sequel and each book has three mysteries to solve three crimes. Mm. So sometime um, the, the, the victim didn't see the one who killed her, they didn't see her murderer. So she's not that useful actually, but she can help with giving clues. Do you ever... Other victims... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Mina. Sorry, Andrew. No, I mean, if you got what I meant, if you got what I meant, it's not always uh, like the victim would come and say, yeah, this one, he killed me, end of story. This, this would be really boring. No, I know that this is a, like a, a book about investigations and mysteries, and but yep. are you somehow inspired by real life when you talk, when you write in in this sort of a structure and you write this sort of narrative? Yep, I, I usually always write about about people that I have actually met in in real life. Really? Yes, I I, I do that. Because um, if I decide that I'm going to write about a specific cafe, I will go to this cafe and write about the waiter that I have that actually works there. So I had a friend who read this novel, and it had the cafe Rish. Actually, cafe Rish was really close to the hotel where you where you stayed. I uh, took some of you last year there. No, <laughs> I you should that. have taken so, me there. Yeah, because you were in the permits, so I didn't have enough time to meet you there. But next year, we'll definitely go there. It's a five minutes walk from your hotel. We'll, 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 we'll film a video about it. I also, yeah, I have a series on my YouTube channel where I film uh, artists taking me places and just showing me their work and talking to me about them. If you're up for that, I'd be so happy. We have to do it because I have so many things to tell you about this place. I'm looking forward to it already. Like yeah, this place is like 130 years old place, so I'll take you there. It has lots of political monuments around there, so I have to take you there. This is a well, great. What? This is a great conversation. Can you believe that we've already been talking for 30 minutes, over 30 minutes? Wow! <laughs> wow! I know it's it's <laughs> great. It's great when you take the time to talk with people. I mean, time really does fly. Yeah, and, and during the festival, you, you were running all over for other interviews, so we didn't have enough time to talk. Oh, you know. But well, I, I am, I'm really glad for this, that, that we have enough time to chat a little bit. But, um, so, but, but uh, also, you're already writing another book? I mean, it's supposed to be published soon. That's what you told me, right, in our converse, previous yes, conversation? Yes, I have a book. That I actually finished writing it, and um, it should be released by February, this February, during our Cairo Book Fair. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it should be out within, like, two weeks or something. That's exciting, the and, Cairo uh, Book Fair. You, uh, you go, what do you do there? You buy books. <laughs> That's it. We oh, have, really? like, um, a pair that is um, 50 years old. We've been doing that, that for half a century. Usually people announce their new books there during this uh, season. And you get to have books uh, with huge discounts, with different genres, uh, different languages. Um, either they are Egyptian books or books from abroad. We, we have like lots of, I mean, we have people usually read a lot of English books 
so we have all of that there. Uh, what's really good about it, it's like you're going to a huge library and you get to meet your favorite authors. We have signatures uh, as well. So uh, this is what we, we usually do. So in Egypt, we have two seasons to publish your books. It's uh, during the summer hmm. by July. And we have the other one for the book fair by the end of January, the beginning of February. Oh, right. That's very interesting. I just It just occurred to me while you were saying that, that we also have Egypt to thank for in terms of writing itself or just committing things to paper because of the yeah. papyruses. I mean, they, were, they sort of uh, invented the whole yeah. concept and made it a lot easier for people to just document things on some type of paper. <laughs> but anyways... Um, so uh, yes. can you can you can you imagine if they didn't do that? I, I oh. would have needed like temples to write stories on. <laughs> or or yeah, exactly. You would have needed to just carve into rocks, and sometimes you know, especially yeah. in in bed, that really wouldn't work out. <laughs> yeah, never. <laughs> and also, it would take it would take forever to write a book. I mean, it would take you a lifetime to write a sentence sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and, and how expensive it would have been. Yeah. You need to build walls to riot. <laughs> I, I don't even think I would have had the patience, you know. But, um, uh, hey, uh, this is a simple question, but maybe, you know, because people might be eavesdropping on our conversation, you know, right now. I, I, I always oh. forget to ask this, but for me, it's also about the very simple things. Um, do you write with pen on paper or do you write on the computer or maybe, you know, a typewriter well, during my teenage years, I, I used to write the entire novel uh, with my hands, like a uh, 200, a uh, 300 pages long A4 mm. with the pen and paper. And it, it, it really caused some medical issues with my hands. Um, I had problems with my nerves and my finger muscles and everything, and it really sucked. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, one so of my I, fingers, I, I, actually, because of the same reason, is it looks it has a bump. You know, <laughs> yes. my left hand. I'm a yeah, left hand. I do have that. My middle finger has a thumb. Hey. Just, just, just right too much. Yeah, I there do that. Go. So exactly, we have lots of things in common regarding this. Yeah. So, uh, but but later on, I um I I started having my own laptop to write on, but I cannot brainstorm on anything other than pen and papers. I have to brainstorm on them. So you write first so pen have, and like, paper. So. Hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, at the beginning, I just uh, I do the whole research phase and the brainstorming phase, and then I start outlining. I always do that on pen and paper. So for each novel, I have its uh, own notebook. Yeah. Uh, but and then when it when it comes to actually writing, you I have to put it on the laptop so I can send it to my publisher. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so I mean, I know that the book isn't officially published, but can you maybe reveal a few things about? the story of this uh, new second literary work that you're about to release? Yeah, I would love to. Well, uh, this is exclusive just for you. <laughs> the, the it's just the two of us Thursday. right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that some people might be eavesdropping, but uh, yeah. But yeah, let's, let's just pretend that they are not around. <laughs> well, um, the book is called Thirteen. Because we have, the, I think we, we, you also have that in the Western world, about uh, that people think that the number 13 is jinx. So from uh, the book takes us back to the 1960s, where this was a very delicate era back in Egypt. Whenever you watch a movie for the 1960s, you see women are very feminine, are very soft, are very delicate. You would never see a criminal or woman committing something bloody or, or something disturbing. This movie, uh, this novel is about a woman who is a murderer. And it has a lot of spiritual and fantasy elements around her crimes and how she commits them. Well, later on, after you read more, you will reveal that we're actually talking about a very important psychological element that may turn someone from an innocent person to a murderer. So I believe it's kind of more educational than just entertaining of action and blood and, and like that. If, if you read it carefully, you will learn more about to how careful you should be when it comes to treating others. Right. Because, uh, something 
something as simple as a compliment or a comment you would give to someone, it can actually turn his life upside down. So this is what the book is, is mainly about. Well, when uh, when it will be released, I hope that you would like to maybe do another call and we can talk about it a bit more and your experience at the book fair and all of the stuff that happened around this new liter- literary work. <laughs> Definitely, and I will give you like exclusive videos of the book and of the book fair and and all the um, press kit that you need. I will provide you with. But uh, th- this is actually what I wanted to ask you: is that are your is your book the previous one, and will this book also be available in an English language version? Are you working on getting that sorted out? The second book, we're working on that. Oh. To, to translate it to both uh, to English and French, I'll be working on that definitely, and also it will have an audio version, so people can listen to it. And so I'm definitely working on that. You are you doing the translation yourself? No, no, I don't oh. think so because my publishers they are they they already deal with translators that they can do very good literary translation. Because my translation is a little bit more practical, not that literary. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, 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 I know because, I mean, I'm fluent in both English and Italian, but I'm still not mm. as good. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to translate yeah, uh, one language into the other. It's weird because I should be able to, but it's, it's, it's difficult. Tricky. Isn't it tricky? Are, are you there? I think we got cut off again. But, yeah, uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so... Yeah, uh, because someone uh, just called. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, well, we're get, I mean, it's it's been 40 minutes, so I I, I, I suppose that, that we should wrap things up because we've got lives to get back to. But it's been a real real pleasure <laughs> talking with you, Mirna. It's been, it's been great. It's been great to catch up with you again. I mean, you 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 really are a very inspiring character to me, and especially uh, when I talk to you a lot, I yeah, I did mimic some of your parts and some of the things that I wrote. No, excuse me for not having. Well, <laughs> I I I, 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 I right. <laughs> wait wait, what do you mean by that? <laughs> because actually, I told that to Gary that you have a very interesting side that I have never seen. Is that how open you are when it comes to expressing yourself? Uh, when you talked to me last year about your visit to the Sphinx and the pyramids, and and how you felt, how you were overwhelmed, and how you've expressed yourself without sticking to this very cliche masculine belief of that you shouldn't be emotional when it comes to expressing yourself, I, I was really inspired with this part in your personality especially that in our eastern world you have to be very al macho all the time yeah so yeah so that really inspired me i i i cried after seeing the sphinx for like an hour straight it was yeah, uh and, and this was really inspired me of how honest you are for just watching something that you've always dreamed of so, so I, I I really owe you this. And it wasn't it, it wasn't because of the beauty of the pyramids and the Sphinx. It was actually the bu- the pyramids really that got to me. It was actually because it made me think about the world in a way that I just had never. I mean, I I I thought I knew, but it's another. It's one thing to think that you know something, but another thing to experience these things. And it was really a cro- it, 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 Yeah, it was absolutely emotional. The world is mysterious, but people are always the biggest mystery. Mm. Exploring people is way harder than just exploring places or the world. Yeah. We're that special, we're that special and we're that interesting. This is why my stories are always about people, not just events. Oh, absolutely. Well, Mirna, thank, thank you for doing this and thanks for talking with me. Uh, we should do this again for sure. We definitely will. And thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to to express my thoughts and share them with you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.